just a few more seconds. I'm just gonna wait until everybody comes. Hi, Jay. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, Isabella. Can everybody hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up if you can all hear me. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Hi, all. Thank you so much, Vanakam, by the way, and thank you for joining us today. This is the Story Trail session with Miss Lakshmi and Miss Naintara. Um, I'm sure most of you are already familiar with story trails, but I'm gonna leave it to them to introduce themselves and set us up for the session. Thank you. And please uh, go ahead and mute your mic so that we can hear, uh, so we can hear everybody. Great. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you, Gautmik, for that lovely introduction. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Lakshmi. And this is my colleague Nayantara here. And we are so delighted to be your storytellers for today. We both belong to a company called Story Trails and we design uh, walking tours and online workshops for adults and for children. And they are based on stories. So we love to chat, we love to discuss stories with a group. And we are so happy to be here with you. So on today's trail, we are going to take you through stories of Madras, stories of the city of Chennai. But before we do that, uh, we just are going to give you the rules for um, you know, the session. Very simple rules. Please keep yourselves uh, muted during the storytelling. And once we are done with the story, we'll open it up for a good five, six minutes of discussion. Uh, we can, uh, you know, you can share all your queries then. And post that, uh, we'll go back to mute and we'll go to the next story. In between, if you want to say something, if you have to say something, no worries, please send it on the chat. And we are so happy to talk with you. We will answer all your questions. And if there's any background noise at your place, a blender or someone on the phone, then please mute yourself. And of course, if at any point something is not clear, please raise your hand and please uh, do ask. And we are most happy to clarify doubts. Thank you so much. So today's session is all about stories of Madras. So tell me, uh, people, and uh, you can probably unmute yourself for a minute after all the rules that I told you. Uh, how old do you think the city of Madras is? Any guesses? Give me a number. How old is the city of Madras? Or rather, okay, let me, let me retrace my steps. What is the old name for Chennai? Chennai is a city in South India. That's why Nainthara and me are coming across to all of you across the world. The old name for Chennai is Madras. And how old do you think is Madras? Any guesses? Feel free to share your numbers. Yeah, do I see anything on the chat screen? Does anyone want to speak up and guess I the think number? Jay has his hands up. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. Go, go ahead. Yes, Jay. Mm. I think about a hundred million years. <laughs> <laughs> we are so happy to hear that. <laughs> that you placed the sign. This okay. We have yeah, five hundred. Five hundred. Yeah. yeah, lovely. Isabella says uh, a hundred. Isabella says 100. Okay, nice three. Oh, and then um, there's another person with 300. Wonderful. So lovely mix, 400. Oh, nice. The answers are coming in now, thick and fast. Thank you, Dave. Thousand. Mm, raising the bar here. <laughs> so wonderful answers. Uh, let me tell you that uh, Saucity 3000. Great. Well, let me tell you that Madras is a very young city. And there, there do you see Chennai, and old name is Madras. It's right on the east coast, close to the Bay of Bengal. And Madras is only around 380 years young. So, yeah, Jay, uh, not so million years ago. You see, Madras as a city 
was only born after the British came here in the 1600s. Before that, there was no one Madras. But how did this journey begin? Why did the Europeans come to India? Let's explore that story. So boys and girls and ladies and gentlemen, can you tell me why do you think the Europeans came to India? What were some of the reasons? Any guesses? Yes, Jay? No oh, he's just got his hand raised. Okay, good food, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> You're after my own heart. Yes, good food is a very good point. Spices says Dorian. Dave think, also says spices. Oh, and there, Olivia, you had your hand up, I think. Yes, Olivia? Um, someone already said spices. Ah, okay, no worries. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So spices, uh, most of you, and fabric, very nice, Varna. So by fabric, uh, it's cotton. Uh, cotton was very popular here. It was very cheap also in India. So yes, they came in here for the spices, for uh, the jewels, for gold, for silver, and uh, all the wonderful treasures of India. But initially, when the Europeans came in, and it was, a, a, you know, people from different countries. So the Portuguese were here, the Dutch, the French and the British. So when they came in here, they came in only to trade, not to rule. So when they came in, they very nicely asked for permission from the local king, whether they can settle at a place. And then once the king gave the permission, they set up a trading post. They called it a trading station. So that's how all, all of them started trading here. And slowly, they began to build a fort. They told the local king they needed protection for their goods. And they built it up. And after they built in their uh, fort, they said, oh, our ships need protection. So we need to have an army. And that's how these trading centers became very powerful forts. And in this way, the British also got control of Madras. Now, how did that happen? Well, in 1600s, a group of Englishmen, they met in England, actually. Ah, there you see it, the crest of the British East India Company. They set up an East India Company in England in 1600s. And a group of them traveled to India. They first docked at a port called Surat. You want to try saying that? Surat. Surat. It, yeah, nice. Thank you, Jay. Surat. Yeah? Surat. Uh, yeah, excellent. Excellent. So Surat, there you see it on the map. It's um, right there on the west coast and it's near a place called Gujarat. So they came to Surat. But why Surat? Surat is a port city. And you know, ports are always flourishing, right? So much of trading and business happening there. So they first got permission from the Mughal Empire to come to Surat. But when the British came in there, there was a problem. You see, the Portuguese and the Dutch, they were already there. And they were giving the British a lot of problems. They could not sustain in Surat. So they quietly, and this is a lovely picture, an old one, of how uh, the British ships were there. The East India Company briefly was um, doing business in Surat. Later, the British made their way southwards. And they came to the east of the coast. And they came to what is now known as Chennai. When they came to this place, they thought it was beautiful. There was so much of coastline, so much of land. People were so friendly. So from the local, there was a local king there. They got permission to buy a small strip of land. In fact, he almost gave it to them for free. That narrow strip of land, it was marshy mosquito infested nobody really wanted it but the two uh, uh, people representing the british east india company they decided to take up that land and it is from that strip of land that their power over madras grew and later went to calcutta and then whole of india so madras was really the first important colony for the british in india now, the British set up a fort in Madras, and that fort they called Fort St. George. And 
Saint George is named after the patron saint of England. Now, when the British were here in Madras, close by in neighbouring, oh, this is a lovely picture of first Saint George. Have a look, very pretty, uh, very nicely laid up. Initially, it had only traders. Yeah, we'll just wait for probably Jay to come back. Yeah, thank you, Jay. So uh, initially, it had only traders, but then slowly. It had accountants because there was so much money coming in. People keeping accounts. It had sailors. It had uh, soldiers. And so the fort started getting bigger and bigger. Then weavers from the neighboring states, they started settling around the fort in a market close to the fort because they were supplying the raw material to the British. And one of the chief exports for the British was cotton textiles. Now, as the fort started getting powerful in Madras, in neighboring Pondicherry, Pondicherry is further south and it's about two and a half hours drive from Madras. And uh, it still exists. It's a, lovely, uh, it's a lovely, lovely place if you ever get to see it. Pondicherry was uh, filled with another European power. Can anyone take a guess? If the British were in Madras, who do you think is most likely to be in Pondicherry? Another, another European. Sorry? Isabella has her hand raised, I think. Not yeah, not. yeah. Thank you, Nainthara. Yes, yeah. Isabella? Um, I, I already um, went to Pondicherry. It ah. was so beautiful. Oh, lovely. And what kind? And of also Mumbai. And also, also Mumbai. Mumbai. Oh, Mumbai is so bustling. Lovely. So Pondicherry, you saw many buildings there, Isabella. What kind of buildings? What kind of architecture? Mm. Do you remember? Mm, like, not really. Because not really? Like it went <laughs> three years ago. <laughs> yeah, I know. Stretching and jogging your memory too much. But let me tell you, and we have some lovely answers on the chat. I saw that. Yes, people, it was the French who were in Pondicherry. And the buildings you saw, Isabella, that's French architecture. So uh, in Madras were the British and in Pondicherry were the French. Naturally, they didn't get along. They were fighting in Europe and they fought here too. Uh, and interestingly, between 1746 to 1749, the French, they ruled Madras. Uh, there you see the French, um, uh, well, they uh, sneaked in, they came in through the market and they actually defeated the British in 1746 and they took over the city of Madras. Funnily enough, uh, the British did not win back Madras uh, through war. They actually won it back because of a treaty. This treaty happened in a tiny little French village called Aix-la-Chapelle. You see, in 1749, when the war was coming to an end in Europe, England and France, they met in a village uh, in France, Aix-la-Chapelle, and they signed the Aix-la-Chapelle Treaty. And by that treaty, they exchanged land with each other. So France just gave back Madras to the British like that. But for that change, I would be telling all these stories to you in French. And I would be blaming the French for all our problems. <laughs> yeah. So um, like this, the uh, Fort St. George, when the British came back after the defeat of the French, well, they made the fort stronger and stronger. It was called by various names. And let me run those names past you. Uh, none of those names exist now. So initially, Fort St. George, uh, today, this is how it looks. It was called initially White Town. And the area surrounding it was a market filled with local traders who were supplying goods and were the lifeline actually for uh, the fort. Uh, that area was called Black Town. Now, the person who sold the piece of land to the British, now he wanted to, uh, you know, get his name in glory. So he told the British, can you name the strip of land after my father? We will be very honored. Well, his father's name was Chennapa Nayak. Yeah, Chennapa Nayak. 
So can you guess from Chennappa Nayak came what? Chennapatnam. Patnam. Oh, yes, Isabella. Sorry. Oh, sorry. All of you had your hands raised and I just rushed into it. Yes, go ahead, Isabella. You want to take a guess? <laughs> That's what you wanted to say. I spoiled it. Okay. Yes. Chenna Patinam. Patinam means a place. And this is Chenna Patinam. Do you like to try saying it? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Nice. It's, you're very sporting, guys. Yeah. Olivia, would you like to take a shot at it? It's a long word, I know. Um, Chenna Patinam. Okay. Can you just yeah. say it again? Yeah, sure. Chennai, 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 very good, Patinam, 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 no, very good, it, it took me a long time to get it also, <laughs> it's a twist of the tongue, no worries, you did very well, so they call that area Chennai Patinam, so that's one story for the origin of the word Chennai, now how did Madras come about? So many theories, children. So let me share that with you. And what historians believe is that three, four uh, theories. One is there was an Islamic school here, a madarsa. So maybe Madras came from that. The second story, maybe there was a Portuguese church here, Medre de Diu. And probably Madras came from that. There could have been a wealthy Portuguese family in Santom, uh, the Medeiros. And so maybe Madras was named that. The fourth theory says Madras at Pattinam already existed before the British came here. Seems it was a nice bustling fishing village to the north of the fort. So when the British came in here, it was already there. So in all, white town, black town, Chenna Patinam, Madras Patinam, they all mixed together and they came up with the name Madras. And then later, the name change happened only in 1996 from Madras to Chennai. And why is this uh, all the more important? Because tomorrow is Madras Day. You see, on August 22nd, the two people uh, from the British East India Company, they signed a document where they bought a piece of land from the local king there. And that piece of land became Madras. And that happened on 22nd August, uh, 1639. So tomorrow is the special day for Madras Day. The two people who bought that piece of land, they belong to the East India Company. And I'll just tell you one interesting fact about them. They were called factors. And the people who managed a trading station, they were called the factors. So the trading station was called a factory. So the British really didn't produce anything in the factory. It was just called a factory because the people managing it were factors. And on that note, we pause for questions from you and hope you enjoyed that introduction to Madras. Good question. You can just unmute yeah. yourselves and go ahead. Thank yeah. you. Oh, thank That's you, why they're Dave. applauding you, as they should. <laughs> thank you, Dave. Um, Very nice to see all of you. If yes. you've got any questions, you can also yeah, just raise your hand or um, you can put it in the chat box. We have another very uh, young person with Isabella who has yes, come in. <laughs> you got an extra guest on. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? <gasps> any doubts? So I, I want to... Yes, yes, Varna. Um, I just wanted to know, so of, of the, theory, the four theories you talk about Madras hmm. and the name, origins of the name Madras, hmm. which one do you believe? Me? Okay. I believe the fourth one. Um, that Madrasa Patinam, uh, I personally believe, <laughs> I'm not a historian, I'm a storyteller. So personally, I think there was a fishing village. It was already flourishing. It was already there as Madrasa Patinam is, is, is a nice, I think is a nice belief I would like to hold on to. And a lot of us refer to the city as Madras, actually. Many of us belonging to the 80s and the 90s, 
we all still say Madras. We really actually don't say Chennai in conversation. My, my dad doesn't like to say. <laughs> ah, see? Yeah. yeah. Born in Madras. Yeah, yeah it's still Madras. the University of Madras. It's the High Court of Madras. So some names the government didn't change. But Chennai and Mad or Madras, well, the city is wonderful. But Madras is a special memory. And, and it, yes. it is a, Hello, it, Michael. a series of villages. So you're saying when Madras, 300 yeah. and odd years. 18, yeah, um, yeah. There were several villages that are older than that. Yes. Absolutely. There are areas in, and Nainthara will tell you that in just the second story, but there are many, uh, many places. No, no, no worries. There are many places in Madras that are actually older than the city of Madras. Uh, she will talk about one of the places. Then there's Tambaram, there's uh, Nungambakam, there are Santom. There are many areas. So it was just like beautiful green land, lots of sand, tiny, tiny villages all scattered everywhere. So it was a lovely place uh, for trading by all accounts. Uh, we'd just like to ask you one uh, question before we, I, I give it over to Nainthara. So what would have happened if the French had ruled India? Say the French did not leave Madras. Say the French stayed on here and they became the rulers of India instead of the British. And they ruled for 400 years if that had happened. Can you think and tell me what changes uh, might have been in India from your uh, perception? Any guesses? Yes, yeah, Olivia. yes, Olivia. Yes. Um, French will be like a second language to India. Yeah, yeah. very good. Yes, absolutely. We would all be speaking in French and learning it in school. Yes, uh, anyone else? What about the things... Uh, what about the game, the sport that you play here? If you, if you know a little bit of India, well, um, I think cricket. India is cricket crazy. And then we love hockey. But if the French had ruled, what game would the Indians have played? Any guesses? Yes, Olivia? Um, soccer. <laughs> yeah, yes, soccer. And we have that from Dorian too. Soccer, absolutely. And then uh, maybe a lot of cheese. A lot of lovely bread. Yeah, things that have really changed in India. Great. Uh, on that note, I give it to my colleague, Nayan Tara. Thank you, Lakshmi. That was a great story. I know I probably shouldn't say that, but I always love hearing you tell that story. Um, <laughs> Thank so you. I'm going I'm I'm to take you to another, another part of Chennai, because Lakshmi has given you sort of the lowdown, lowdown on how Madras begins as a city. Um, and you now you know how old Chennai is, or rather how young Chennai is. But, you know, as we asked, as, as someone asked, um, you know, are there parts of Chennai that are older? Yes, there are. Um, one of these parts is an area called Mailapur, and that's what you're seeing on your screen right now. Mailapur is about 2,000 years older than the rest of Chennai. Yeah, Isabella, do you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. I think I already went there. You think you've already mm -hmm. been here? Mm -hmm. Lovely. All right. So then you can you can see how much of my story I'm getting right because maybe you know this one already. Yes. Yeah? So Mailapur is um, really quite ancient. We know a lot about it because there's so much ancient literature that's been written about it. Now, the oldest literature that talks about Mailapur, the oldest books and poems and stories, they come from ancient Tamil literature. Tamil is the local language right, in Chennai. And this literature is called Sangam literature. And so this Tamil literature talks about this beautiful port city called Mailapuram. And they say that Mailapuram was grand and wonderful. You know, the people here were gorgeous and generous and kind. And of course, they would say that. Whenever we're describing our own things, we've got to say <laughs> nice things, don't we? So, you know, we'll take that with a pinch of salt and instead look at what all the foreign travelers and writers, what, what did outsiders have to say about this place? Surprisingly, quite a lot. The earliest literature about Mailapur from outside of India comes from 140 CE just a little under 2000 years ago. So there was this Greek scholar called Ptolemy. And Ptolemy wrote about this fabulous port city in the East called Mylarfa. Now, historians today will tell you that Mylarfa, Mylapo, exactly the same thing. I know they don't really sound that alike, but you know, European tongues, Indian names never really mixed. And we've also got the accounts of the Romans who 
back Ptolemy up in a way because the Romans came to India to trade in the first century CE. But they didn't land in Madras or Chennai. They landed on the western coast of India in a place called Kerala. And once the Romans landed there, they did a lot of trade in spices and cotton, all the things you were discussing. And then the Romans decided they were going to walk across the peninsula. Very brave thing to do. And as they walked, they shopped. The Romans were big shoppers. They loved buying things, especially something called black gold. Does anyone know what black gold is? Can anyone give me a guess? It's something you eat. Yeah, Isabella? Maybe it's like um, something like made with pepper or something. Very good. You're, you're on the money. You've got it exactly right. It's pepper, black pepper. It was such a valuable commodity to the Romans. They bought it in bulk and they paid for all of it in gold. I see we've got some answers in the chat as well. Yes, pepper, exactly, Dorian and Kisang. We've gotten pepper. The Romans loved it. They bought it for so much gold. And very often they even used pepper as currency. So if you were Roman, you would sometimes buy and sell things with pepper along this coast, which is quite fascinating. But the other thing that the Romans loved was cotton. So they bought that in big quantities as well. So the Romans were here for a long time. Now, after that, to sort of understand the history of Mylapur, we, we leave aside the foreign travelers and we'll come back to some locals. Between the sixth and the ninth century, there were a dynasty that were very big and very powerful in this part of South India. They were called the Pallavas. Let me just see if, so yeah. So you can see on your map, there's a location that I've marked called Mamalapuram. Mamalapuram is just south of Chennai. And that is where the Pallavas really, not ruled from, but it was a big trading city, a big port city for them. So the Pallavas were quite powerful. They had a lot of ships and they had these two port cities, Mamalapuram and Mailapur. And from these port cities, they traded extensively, especially with Southeast Asia. So think Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, right? those areas. And they would send out all of these wonderful goods, the spices, the gold, the cotton. But they also sent out ideas, ideas about language, religion, architecture, food. So all of these ideas went back and forth between Southeast Asia and the southern part of India. And that's why even today, when you visit Thailand or Indonesia, you find there are these interesting similarities between their culture and South Indian culture. You won't see it so much with the North, right? And that's because of the Pallavas. So they were sort of the big bosses of this area for a while. After the Pallavas, we go back to the accounts of another trader again, Marco Polo. Have you all heard of Marco Polo? You can just give me a thumbs up if you have here. Yeah? Marco Polo, right? Like, crazy guy. He's supposed to have walked all the way to China <laughs> from Europe. I mean, very brave, I think, especially in those days. Well, after he finished up in China, you know, the Chinese put him in a ship and they said, okay, go home now. But Marco Polo, he wasn't having any of that. He got on his ship, he explored Southeast Asia a bit, they say, and then in 1292, he landed in Mylapur. He was amazed by everything he saw. So he wrote down pages and pages about it. And he noticed one very interesting custom amongst the locals. He noticed the locals of Mylapur, they wouldn't start anything new for a, a 90 minute period of each day. These 90 minutes, they are called the Rahu column. Show you a picture of Marco Polo. So he noticed this Rahu Kalam time period, and essentially, people in Mylapur believed that it was a very inauspicious time, right? Anything you start in the Rahu Kalam ends in disaster. So people followed it. Yeah, Isabella, do you have a question? Go ahead. Um, I don't really understand from which country Marco Polo was. Yeah, he was Venetian, right? So he came from sort of the modern, modern day Italy, from, from that region. Okay. So when Marco Polo came here, he noticed this Rahu Kalam, the inauspicious time. Um, now, the Rahu Kalam is still followed today. If you were to visit Mylapur today, a lot of people still live very much by it. So they will not sign a business contract in the Rahu Kalam. They will not arrange a wedding. Um, they don't even release new movies during the Rahu Kalam because you don't want a box office disaster on your hands, right? So you wait for the Rahu Kalam to pass and then everything goes off swimmingly. That is the belief. So it's quite interesting because you know, you could just Google the Rahu Kalam timings if you really want to know it. You could just type in Rahu Kalam, put in today's date, and you'd get it. Um, but yeah, today in India, we've sent a rocket ship off to space. Well, I'm pretty sure they checked for the Rahu Kalam before they did it. 
Now, after that, after Marco Polo, we've got, um, we've got the arrival of the Portuguese. The Portuguese come in the 17th century. They came, I'm uh, sorry, in the, 50, in the 16th century. They arrived in 1522 and they came to trade and they settled down right near the coast, right? Quite close to Mylafo. Now, the Portuguese, they weren't very keen on getting to know the locals, you know. So they pushed all the locals that were living by the coast further inland. And where the Portuguese settled down, that became their white town. They had their own little trading township. The locals got pushed in further and further, and where they settled became the black town. Um, Portuguese and the Indians, they, they did a bit of business, but mostly they stayed separate. And then after that, finally, the British got here in the 17th century, and you know all about that. Lakshmi's told you all about that. Once the British got their own... Nainzara, we have a question from Gil about what yeah. time of the day is, is the Rahu Kalam. Oh, yeah, sure. So the Rahu Kalam changes. There is a set time. So it's the same time every Monday, but it's a, it's a different time on a Tuesday and a different time on a Wednesday. And they say that it's been the same time for thousands of years because it's based on the position of a planet, actually. Right? So um, I think that on a Monday, it falls between 5 and 7.30, if I'm not wrong. And yeah. it changes every couple of years by a couple of milliseconds. Honestly, to get a very accurate answer, like I said, just Google it. Everything's on Google these days, right? So put in today's date and you'd get an exact timing for today as well, down to the milliseconds. I think we're all doing it. <laughs> you're all doing it. Great. No, go ahead. And then you can let me know. I hope I hope we're not in the Rahu column right now because that would be such bad news. <laughs> no, but Varna says, no, we're not. Okay, Varna, I, I believe you and I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> so Thank I was you. just... Sorry. Yeah, not a problem. No, not a problem. Thank you. I didn't see that. Um, so I was just saying, you know, then when the British came and they bought themselves that strip of land, they were trading with everyone. The traders who were living in this Mylapur area, they also began to get quite rich, you know. Now, the story is that when the Portuguese came and settled down near the coast, there was already a much older um, Hindu temple right there by the coast, but it fell into ruin. And when the British arrived and started making these traders quite rich, the traders, the Indian traders, they decided they were going to rebuild that older temple, right, inland. They were going to take the ruins and use it to actually build the entire temple up. And let me show you what they built. And so what they built was this temple that you're seeing right here in front of you. So this temple is in Mylapur. It's one of the big landmarks of Mylapur. And it's about 300 years old. And it is called the Kapalishwar Temple. Yeah, Isabella, what's your question? I went with my driver. You went with your driver and saw it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this temple, just in case you missed it that time. So um, now I told you it was the Kapalishwar temple. Now, who is Kapalishwara? Kapalishwara is, of course, a Hindu god. Let's talk about Hindu gods because you know, India has no scarcity of gods. By one count, we've got 330 million gods. <laughs> but the numbers change depending on who you're asking. Some people say, no, no, we don't have that many. We've only got one. Some people say 10. Some people say none. So it really does depend. But 330 million is a big number. Why so big? Well, in many parts of India, they don't just believe in the gods as, you know, sort of physical human looking gods, but they also worship trees and plants and animals and stars. So it kind of adds up, right, over time. Now, of all of the 330 million gods, most Hindus seem to agree that there are three big gods. They're the big boss gods, you know. So you've got um, Brahma, the god of creation. You've got Vishnu, who is the god of protection. And you've got Shiva, who is the god of destruction. Now, this is a Shiva temple. People do ask, but why do you worship the god of destruction? I mean, isn't it a bit, it seems a bit not really normal, right? Because he's quite scary. Well, Shiva can be, but you know, Shiva isn't a vindictive god. He isn't mean-spirited. He doesn't destroy the world because he woke up one morning in a really bad mood, right? Uh, rather, they say that Shiva waits for the entire world to slide into chaos, for things to get so bad. We humans, we have no chance of fixing the situation ourselves. And then he destroys the world. So what he's doing is he's wiping the slate clean. He's giving everyone a chance to sort of be recreated. Because once he's destroyed the world, Brahma can come along and Brahma will recreate the entire universe. Everyone gets a second chance. Now, how does Shiva destroy the world? You might think asteroid or flood or something like that. But Shiva does something very simple, actually. He dances. 
Now, it isn't that he's such a bad dancer. We all take one look at him, keel over and die in horror. You know? Rather, they say that Shiva dances with such energy, with such sort of passion, that he's got to absorb energy to keep dancing, to keep going. And where does he get it from? They say he sucks it in from everything around him. And eventually, when there's no energy left out there, there can't be any life. So when Shiva finishes dancing, there's only two things left in the entire world. There's Shiva himself, he's the last man standing, but in his hand, he holds a skull. And that skull is what Brahma uses to recreate the entire universe. So the word for skull in Sanskrit is kapalam. And the word Ishwara means God. So this is the Kapalishwara temple. It is the temple of the God who dances with a skull in his hand. He's very dramatic, right? So he has great stories. If you're ever in Chennai and you have a chance, make sure you visit the Mailapur Kapalishwara temple. It's, it's quite beautiful and I think really worth sort of visiting. And with that, I'm going to stop the story and take any other questions if anyone's got any. Has anyone found out what time the Rahu column is today? <laughs> I did. <laughs> when is it Lakshmi? We should all know. It's, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's 10.30 uh, a.m. to 12. Okay, so we, 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 we missed our it. Our session is not in Rao Kalam, guys. Just Excellent. to reassure everyone. <laughs> yeah, Varna? <laughs> okay. So any, any questions for me? Anything that was unclear or anything that you just have to ask? Linda, great to see you. Some of our guests from our trails, trails. I think, are here. So yeah. <laughs> as I'm seeing the names, it's very exciting to see them. <laughs> yes, any questions? Feel free to use the chat box below. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh -huh. not, you want to go ahead with the next story, Lakshmi? Yeah, sure. I think that was so much fun. <laughs> I laughed so much. <laughs> that was a great story. So um, everybody, uh, let me take you across to uh, another monument in Chennai. But before we get into that monument, let me ask you, uh, how would life have been for an Englishman living in the 1600s in Madras? What is the first thing that would have struck him for the people who have been in Madras in Chennai, what is the first thing that hits you? Any thoughts? No? The heat. Well, the heat. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the heat. So the, un <laughs> the unrelenting heat, uh, the language was a barrier mosquitoes were plentiful the water was not something up to their liking so they had a very tough time here in madras but the britishers well they took all of it in their stripe and funnily enough they even dressed in the typical english fashion for the day so if you have a look there you see they dress like this even in hot and sweltering madras so they wore tight pantaloons and really, really tight pants. They wore a stiff high collar. And of course, there was a waistcoat and an overcoat. And not to forget, stretchy wigs, gloves, and a top hat. Have a look. <laughs> Dressing like this in hot Madras. Well, they could have knocked off a few layers and made themselves comfortable. But no, that would have been uh, like dressing like uh, the Indians and they didn't want to do that. They wanted to stand out. At the end of a long, hot day at work, well, they would have definitely loved to take a nice cold bath, a shower. They, I'm sure they did that. And they would have also loved to have a cold drink. Now, a drink might have been there, but the ice was not there. You see, we are talking of a time before refrigeration. So let's cut across the oceans and let's go to the United States of America, to a place called New England, and meet a very enterprising young man there, Frederick Tudor. Do you want to try saying his name? Frederick Tudor. We can call him Freddie too. 
Well, Frederick Tudor uh, was uh, always thinking of new ideas. He never really wanted to take uh, the established path. So uh, he looked at the lakes in New England. And let me tell you, New England is full of lakes. And in winter, the water in these lakes turns into ice. So Freddie looked at this ice and I believe he had a Eureka moment. Why not ship this ice to the tropics? Simple. He'll make a killing. And he actually did it. Have a look. These are some of the early uh, times where he was harvesting the ice. It was such hard work, children. Uh, they used crowbars. They used, uh, you know, chisels and hammers. And they dug up the ice until one of his friends came up with an idea to take the ice out with a special blade. And that came much later. So he thought, let's ship this ice to the tropics. Let's do a dry run between Cuba and Havana. It was very successful. So then he became more bold, more adventurous. He decided, let me ship this ice all the way to India. Now journey to India from all the way from New England, that was about four months across choppy seas. So they put the ice in and sent it off to India. When the ship docked in India, Freddie's heart was in his mouth. Would the ice survive? What do you think, boys and girls, and ladies and gentlemen, did the ice survive? Any guesses? Yes, <laughs> Linda says yes. No. Yeah, uh, no, no. We have a no coming in from Govin. Saucity says at least half. Very good, very good answers. So yes, nearly two thirds of the ice was intact. You see, he had done his homework beautifully. He had done so many experimentations with how to preserve ice. And so finally when he sent it, he packed it with fine sawdust and felt. So they kept uh, the temperature down and the heat out. So it seems the British in Calcutta declared it to be a holiday. Who wouldn't? There was ice coming to India. People were queuing up in all the three ports of Bombay, Calcutta and Madras to buy the ice. So Freddie decided, oh, so much of ice I'm sending. People have to store the ice, right? So he went ahead and he built ice houses in Madras, in, Ch in uh, Bombay and in Calcutta. The one, this is the old ice house in Madras. Have a look. It's a beautiful stately building right close to the sea. They were double walled, windowless and uh, circular structures like this to take in all that ice coming in from the ships. The ones in Bombay and in Calcutta sadly do not survive anymore. Uh, but you do have the ice house in Madras. It still looks like this today by the beach. Have a look. Doesn't it look like a cake with trimmings on it, <laughs> right? Um, it looks so pretty. So how did it end up looking like this from what we saw? Well, you see, um, when the ice came in, uh, it was doing such great business and Freddie was making like millions. But then with the introduction of electricity and more processes, Freddie's ice business, well, it melted away. So he sold his ice house to an Indian who tried to make it homely with windows and uh, verandas, uh, but it didn't last for long. Then an Indian seer called Swami Vivekananda. You might have heard of him. Swami Vivekananda was a wonderful speaker. He was from Bengal in India. He went to attend the International Conference of Religions in Chicago in 1896. After he made a beautiful speech there, he came back and in India, in Chennai, they made him stay at the ice house. And when he left, they made it into Vivekananda house. Or rather, they dedicated the place to him. Today, it is a museum dedicated to Vivekananda. But in the past, it was the very thrilling ice house. And it still exists today. We pause here for questions. And uh, I think we have uh, time to questions saw that. Yes, we pause here for questions. 
We have just over a minute, so. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Please feel so, free to ask, I mean, for any questions in the chat box, anything at all. <laughs> anything, if you like to, but it's interesting to know that so ice came so long ago. Yes, please. It was built in 1842, the ice house. Uh, he did the business from 1830 to 1870. So nice, big, solid years of sending ice to all over to india singapore rangoon islands everywhere he sent it so i don't think we have uh, questions anymore no nayantara i don't think we have questions and uh, well well then yes uh, uh, it was wonderful meeting all of you and uh, thank you for your enthusiasm and participation and seeing some old familiar faces was such a thrill. It was beautiful and thank you, yes. Thank you for organizing it for us, Gautmi and Shireen. And um, please come uh, and, uh, you know, um, enjoy, whenever you come to India, come to beautiful city of Chennai and enjoy the lovely uh, monuments that we have here. We were so delighted to tell you the stories. Yes, Nayantara, would you like to add a word? Yeah, no, uh, it was so much fun. I hope you all enjoyed yourselves. Yeah. And yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Miss Lakshmi, Miss Nayantara. And yeah. thank you all for joining us. Please uh, carry on with your Mela day and thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Please check out Story Trails at storytrails.in and for, for all information and yes. join their workshops. See you. Yes, great. Lovely Bye. to see you, Bindu. Oh, lovely, hey, Linda. Hi, Linda. Hi, Linda. Hi, Dave. Hi, Dave. Great to see you, Dave. Hi, <laughs> Jesse. <Linda>. Isabella. <laughs> we have to Isabella's been waving for like a solid five <laughs> yeah. minutes. Five. I have to meet now, Isabella. Yeah, you've got to come and Jay, visit us again. Jay, oh, wonderful, Jay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> lovely. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you Jesse. Thank you. Wonderful bunch. Great. Bindu, how are you? Very well, very well. <laughs> we made a beautiful connection with the third trader on the chat window. We were, we were learning about monuments. Oh, lovely. Oh, actually, lovely. Yeah. Great. Ah, Thank you so much. Good. Yeah. useful. Yes, yes. We love to Isabella, do more you of wear this. Your, your hand out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Isabella also comes from Italy, I think. Yes. Right, Isabella? Yeah. And, and so Marco Polo makes <laughs> connection. an interesting connection there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Isabella. You were awesome. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Can I leave the meeting? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> okay, bye. 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 Yes, thank, thank you so much. No, thank you. I, you guys are amazing. And <laughs> thank you so much. I, like, oh, <laughs> world machine. I loved it. And I will, I will check out more of your online stuff. At, yes, uh, I'll just email you. I think you're marked on that email, right? With I, 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 yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'll just email you. We'll fix up a time to chat. We and I'll take you through that. all the workshops we have. And I think there's lots of synergies because the children today, uh, they were so curious and interested. Yeah. So yes. this is exactly our, uh, you know, our forte. It's our place project. of strength. And For we sure. can share history, stories of yes. colonial history and other history with we, the kids. We yeah? love so, that. I mean, uh, Shireen and I will connect with you. At, um, yeah. Maybe yeah. Late next week, and we'll 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 work. Yeah, today. let's do yeah. that. I'll send yeah. an email to both of you. Right. That would be lovely. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for your time. It was it was kind of amazing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Oh, we had a great oh, time, and thank you so much for your kind words, and thank you for organizing all of this so smoothly and very nice. We had nervous butterflies because it's a <laughs> large virtual. Yeah. Event, but yeah. Let's see. Please join us for some of the others. Take a walk around our virtual map and see what oh, might. Actually, we, we just might. No, we we'll yeah. just see our schedule and, and we'll, we'll just see if we can Please. come in. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so definitely. Much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Nayantara.